Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Thursday, June 23rd, 2022. I'm very happy to be here with Professor Emily Brodsky. Emily, it's great to be with you. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Emily, to start, would you please tell me your title and institutional affiliation? Uh, I am a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Tell me about the department at Santa Cruz. Is it in growth mode? Is it an exciting place to be right now? Yeah, I think we're doing okay. Um, we have arguably one of the strongest earthquake groups around. Um, and um, we're also a very strong geophysics program in general, um, sort of top 10 in various rankings if you care about those things and uh, you know generationally we're sort of about to do some turnover so uh, yeah it's, it's a good place. Emily just for a snapshot in time what are you currently working on? How long do you have? Um, <laughs> um, in general I work on um, earthquake problems I'm interested in the mechanics of earthquakes um how they trigger each other what makes them start um uh how, how they get big and i um also tend to work on other things that i feel like are like earthquakes like glaciers and landslides and granular flow phenomenon and we're in friction um in a sort of fundamental mechanic sense and um i so you know when i'm peeling Lib, I say basically I like things that fail catastrophically. Yeah. Um, I also do volcanic eruptions too. And so I do those things from a variety of angles, um, some of it seismological, and, um, but I also think that you're never going to learn about microscopic physics seismologically. So I also have a lab. We, we do analog experiments and um, I do borehole measurements where I've taken the temperature of faults and look at hydrological properties. And we also do some structural geology where we go out and actually look at fault outcrops and look at the scars of the earthquakes and what that tells us about process. Emily, a ripped from the headlines kind of question, the devastating earthquake in Afghanistan yesterday. Are you involved in that already? Are you following what's happening? Oddly, no. I mean, it wasn't that large an earthquake. Um, so in I, I know I have not taken a good look at the Afghanistan earthquake other than what you have also read in the headlines. Now, is that because it's below a certain magnitude threshold where it doesn't necessarily, you know, come on your radar? There's a certain amount of that. Um, it's, there's a certain amount of I have other things I'm doing at the moment. Um, and um, there's a certain yeah, amount of, uh, we'll leave it at that. Emily, what aspects of your research are more on the theory side and what are more on the observational or experimental side? Um, I am pretty firmly an observationalist. Um, and I sort of, the experiments are an outgrowth of the observational piece. Okay, so I am about interpreting observations. Um, although I have, you know, so I always say the candle burns on both ends, that you try to go after things from first principles, and you go after things empirically, and you hope they meet in the middle. Uh, but I do, I do a certain amount of just flat out statistics of earthquakes where we uh, one of the things I'm doing right this second is um, my student, Kellyan, has just uh, constructed a machine learning framework to uh, forecast seismicity based on past seismicity. And um, this outperforms sort of our previous way to do it, which was um, based on these um, statistical models that were highly parameterized. And this is a much more flexible framework. Um, and it does better when we use um, bigger catalog, the sort of parameterized version kind of saturated. It did as well as it could do, and then it stopped improving when you got to about 10,000 earthquakes, where currently earthquake catalogs are a lot bigger than that, and we could do better than that. And so that's, you know, a really very empirical thing for approach on the problem. Can we 
predict what's going to happen next empirically with what we've done before. And so that's being, being an observationalist. But then another line of things that I do is um, say, um, I have another student, Weyun, who is working on taking um, known perturbations of stress cases where we know something got triggered either by human activity, like you pumped water in and out of the ground, or you um, um, had a large earthquake that shook the ground and those dynamic waves triggered it. All of those things can trigger earthquakes. And so you know the stress in and you know the earthquake rate out and so you can make some relationship between causative stress and earthquake rate. And you can do that empirically, but now you're getting a little bit closer to physics, right? That you, uh, so that's kind of, I would call myself an observationalist, but it has a pretty strong theoretical implication. Um, and so we're working out empirically those distributions of what we have found in previous studies is that at least from the dynamic triggering piece, it appears that faults out there are distributed over the earthquake cycles in Southern California in a uniform way, so that you have as many earthquakes at a Pascal from failure, as many faults as a Pascal from failure as 100 Pascals from failure. And so, um, and then now we're beginning to ramp up by trying theoretically to reproduce that observation. So it's a bit of a yes and yes. Emily, when you go out and do field work, of course, it's a big planet, resources are limited. What's most compelling to you when you make those decisions about where to go and what to study? Whether or not I'm really going to learn something. Um, and that it's not just because it's there, but it's an opportunity to answer something fundamental. Um, so I orchest helped orchestrate a fairly large project to drill into the fault after the Tohoku earthquake. Here, here's my chick you mug. All right. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and I have, have got, got a collection of coffee mugs here. There's my Expedition 343 mug. Um, my students will tell you there's always a coffee mug somewhere near me. Um, and uh, yeah, there you go. Um, and so that was because one of the big fundamental sort of first principle problems in earthquake physics is what's the friction on the fault during an earthquake. And the only way you could really figure it out was to go take a fault's temperature and measure the dissipate, frictionally dissipated energy after an earthquake. And so to do that, you need a big drill ship to go run after a big earthquake. And we did that. Um, so, um, and so, you know, there was a very clear decision there about, you know, what should be done, in part because we thought about it before the earthquake and we kind of had identified a good question. Um, currently, I'm working on orchestrating um, a fairly large adventure initiative called SC4D to instrument um, a plate boundary in a way to understand the full earthquake cycle, um, sort of in context, in geological context. Um, on a subduction zone. And again, we had, in order to decide where and what to do, what we've been doing is we took a very systematic approach. We looked at all the segments of subduction zones around the world um, and, you know, systematically said, All right, is it going to actually, is there enough logistical and geographic context and, more, and is there enough scientific context? And does it move fast enough? It doesn't have the right kind of earthquakes. And all of those sorts of questions, is it, you know, generalizable? And so when you get all the way down to that, we're heading to Chile. Um, and so um, I, you know, that's a long way of saying I pick where I go because I want to answer something and I don't really care where it is. I've worked in the basin and range. I've worked in Italy. I've worked in China. I've worked where else? Oh, Taiwan. Japan, obviously, Kamchatka, um, a number of places, California, obviously. Um, and it's, you go where there's enough context, that's part of it, and you could really answer a question. 
Emily, given the centrality in your research agenda to really trying to understand the underlying processes that trigger earthquakes, where does that put you within the broader debates of whether or not earthquakes are predictable? It puts me in a very special place, <laughs> which is that um, I am a very strong advocate of studying whether or not earthquakes are predictable. I don't think we know the answer to that question. I think there are enough hints out there, particularly in the current instrumentation era, there are hints that didn't exist before now that are there now that suggest that they might be under certain circumstances or certain kinds of earthquakes might be predictable. Uh, but um, And so I do think it is really important to study those, those um, hints. Um, and I think that um, sort of claiming at the outset that they're unpredictable is as unfounded right now as claiming that they are predictable. As we both well know, there are lots and lots of seismologists who have thrown up their hands and declared earthquakes to be fundamentally unpredictable. In those debates, at conferences, in papers, what do you find the most effective arguments to say, I just don't, I'm not ready to go there yet? How do you convey that? Oh, I show, I have a slide for that, uh, which is, um, I lean very heavily on the uh, 2014 Iquique earthquake, as well as the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, both of which had very strong migratory foreshock sequences and um, geodetic signals that are somewhat ambiguous, but imply that there was a seismic uh, slip event beforehand. And then, so there's some pretty clear evidence there that there's something worth studying for those particular earthquakes. Now, whether that applies to any other earthquakes, who knows, but it's also quite clear that we didn't have the right kind of data before now to ever even ask that question. And so there's, it's um, a sort of physically founded thought that is observationally founded as well. And so that's, and I, I think what, post Ikike, I don't think people have ar been arguing about it as much as they used to. Do you see this in some regards in generational terms? In other words, are people who don't believe that earthquakes are predictable are of an older generation primarily? Yes. What do you think that's about? I think that's about PTSD. Um, <laughs> um, that they thought and were very optimistic in the 1970s about earthquake prediction in early 80s, and it didn't happen. And they um, ended up in a very difficult place in terms of policy and um, having overpromised. And they. Um, uh, they, they didn't see that they had succeeded in their lifetimes and thought we should move on as a field. What are some of the predictive technologies that might give you cause for optimism that ultimately this is where we can head? It, it's about the geodetic revolution and also the density of instrumentations. I mean, you know, what we can see observationally now is unbelievable compared to what they could see. You know, they were trying it to do it, you know, on one lousy geodetic record here and there. So um, do I have to explain? I don't know how technical I'm allowed to be for this. Oh, Did well, I'm going to track you, but as you know, you, it's it's whatever you feel comfortable explaining. Okay. I can, geod geodesy is um, the slow deformation of the earth as opposed to seismology, which is the fast deformation of the Earth. And um, and when I'm feeling snarky, the difference is whether or not you include MA. Um, F equals MA is <laughs> right. seismology, and no MA is geodesy. Right. Um, so, um, and in order to track the earthquake cycle, the full earthquake cycle, I think people understood theoretically for a long time that you want to capture both the slow and the fast motion, right? 
And, you know, there was a generation of efforts to capture that slower motion as part of the earlier efforts at earthquake prediction. And, you know, the technology wasn't there yet. Um, the ad, you know, Earthscope that put um, GPS instruments kind of everywhere on the plate boundary, INSAR, where we have satellite based maps of deformation, um, it's a real revolution. And, um, and the hints that I was referring to are actually offshore slow motion. So you actually need to get the instrumentation under the water for these really big earthquakes, you know, like really significantly under the water and a lot of it. And so it, there's real reason to believe we weren't able to look at the right spots. I mean, and the other thing, what I was just saying about earthquake catalogs, earthquake catalogs used to cap out around a thousand or tens of thousands. And, you know, we now know that when we, we can make a million earthquake catalog, and when we do that, and we sort of upgrade our analytical tools to match, there is more signal there, there's more to look at. And so, um, Hiro and I, although he um, used to have a joke, um, Hiro Kanamori and I, when I was a grad student, about fruit flies. And for a while I had a picture of a fruit fly uh, tacked up on my bulletin board, uh, which is that, um, uh, you know, genetics made great progress when you have these many, many generations of short generations and you can start to do population statistics and um, you can't do statistics at individual events. It, it can't be done. And so, um, it, and asking about uh, predictability is a statistical question. So you need populations and you need to be able to capture seismicity rates. And that's all about having fast generations and little events. And so as we have increased our technology to be able to capture little teeny tiny earthquakes, the way earthquakes work is there are 10 times as many magnitude threes as fours and 10 times as many fours as fives, et cetera, all the way up. And so the smaller you go, the better your statistics, the better your ability to look at rate changes, and it looks different. Emily, given, given that the onus presumably here would be, okay, ultimately to prove that you're right, predict the earthquake before it happens. When do you feel like you, your colleagues, the field, the technology, when will you get to that point where you can demonstrate actually, yeah, one is coming and then there it is? Um, I am not saying that it will ever be done. I said that we should be studying it. Yeah. Okay, so I am not willing to, and I think that might have been part of the PTSD, is people were willing to put some numbers on that at some point in time, and I don't think, I don't, I am, I would like to get to the point where I could give an answer to it is or is not predictable, whether or not we are actually predicting. Um, and, um, you know, so my bar is kind of low. Um, and I do think if we had several decades of instrumentation expansively over a subduction zone like Chile, and we let it sit there for an earthquake cycle, 30, 40 years at least, um, we would know the answer, given how many magnitude eights and stuff you have there. It's as much a philosophical question as a scientific one, which is why I love asking it. To the extent that we cannot yet predict earthquakes, what about the Earth itself? Do you think the Earth knows when an earthquake is going to happen? Well, of course, that's the question. That's the real question, right? That, to me, that's the real scientific question. I don't think that that one's philosophical at all. Um, and, um, and I think that's where people come down on different sides of this problem is when they think whether or not there's something fundamental in the system. I don't think it's been proven. I, do, I think people lean a lot on stuff like chaos theory without bothering to do the quantification that goes with chaos theory. So I think there's a certain amount of sloppy thinking there. Um, and um, I don't know. I simply don't know. Um, and so that's what I want to know. 
And that's what I'm trying to carefully craft an agenda to do. The quantum revolution that we're in right now, from quantum sensors to the simulative possibilities of quantum computers, what factor do you think this will play ultimately in earthquake prediction? None. Because earthquakes are classical? I just don't see the connection. Interesting. Some people are excited about that. Where's the break for you? I Maybe I don't know enough about quantum computing, uh, but I, I don't see why that would be relevant. Emily, what are some of the things that your graduate students are working on right now that might give a window into the future of the field? Well, I just told you about Recast, which is this machine learning piece. Um, I'm very interested in learning about the distribution of um, trying to quantify how the earth organizes itself into a particular distribution of stresses, a particular arrangement of um, stresses on faults and what that means about triggering and um, initiation. Um, and so I have a student working on that that I just mentioned to you. Um, uh, what else? Will, who popped in at the beginning of this conversation, by the way, also, well, he was a Caltech undergrad. Um, he, um, he is working on an analog system in the lab where we are able to fully image a whole sequence of ruptures. It's a nice soft system, so the whole it's like looking at a fault to being able to see how they all interact. And I do think that sort of approach, again, we're going to be able to say what causes what causes what in this. Um, and I think there is a, I hate using the phrase because it kind of is poisoned, but some sort of self-organization criticality going on there and trying to understand it at that level is an important part of it. Uh, what else is everybody doing? Um, a form. I'm very interested. Another piece of that is understanding the scale dependent strength of uh, the crust. You know, what is the failure stress? Of so well, I've just given you a lot of stories about the loading stress, you know, in some simplified form. The earthquake problem is about loading stress and failure strength and when do they meet? And so um, we, I'm doing a bunch of stuff on trying to understand what the strength of the crust is at the scale of the crust. And most of what we know about the strength of the crust is from laboratory experiments about yay big. Um, and so, um, and there, so that's a lot of the work I've done on fault roughness sort of leads in that direction, looking at fault exposures and the topography of a fault surface and asking what information is contained into that, uh, what in that wear scar about the process that made the wear. And if it's making wear, that's making it fail. And that's the strength, right? So, <laughs> so that's the logic. And so, um, so we've done a ton of stuff of going out and looking at faults and measuring the topography at various scales. And then um, we have an indenter in the lab and now we measure strength at various scales and um, try to make those two data sets talk to each other. And uh, Valer uh, um, uh, Lambert, who actually is also a Caltech alum, is now my postdoc, um, is working on sort of building up some theory to connect those two pieces of information. Um, what else? What else? Uh, Ricky, who, Ricky Garza Garon, um, who has no Caltech affiliation, um, is uh, just graduated, and um, and he's been working on sort of amplifying earthquake catalogs, specifically during big volcanic eruptions. So this is kind of a different problem, but you know, it's a related. There are some related issues, um, and I've been doing a search. I certain amount of work on volcano predictability as well, but uh, which is in some sense an easier problem. Eruptions are known to be predictable, at least in certain circumstances. Um, but what he's actually doing is looking at co-eruptively 
it's we have historically been totally blind during an eruption because there's you know shit coming out of the ground and um a lot of seismic noise and so um what he's been doing is using modern methods to extend our earthquake catalog get all those little guys i keep talking about and look at seismicity rates during an eruption and um that uh helps us um uh, sort of understand how it opens and closes repeatedly he finds that the earthquakes anti-correlate with when shit comes out of the ground um and so that actually helps it so it's building up pressure it makes earthquakes and then releases its cap so i think that is a big future of volcanology is these high resolution methods um what am i missing heather uh shaddix um just graduated and what we had been working on was using seismology um to look at non earthquake signals in particular oceanic internal waves um which also load the ground um and those um it turns out that you can use island stations to learn about this oceanic signal which is a pretty important signal for um internal waves are thought to play a big role in uh transport um of both energy and mass and nutrients in the uh, ocean and it's possible that their uh, behavior is changing with climate change and so we're sort of opening up this idea of using seismology in a historical sense because seismometers have been there for a while to look at climate change and so that sort of bleeds into I sort of a sideline over the years has been environmental seismology mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a bit of a growth industry uh, where we use the fact that lots of things pound on the earth rivers and glaciers and landslides to um say something about those processes and i've had students do that over the years uh, we've done a bunch of fluvial seismology the glacier stuff has been really fun the glaciers are like some of the glaciers the big ones uh will ice stream is like an earthquake but better because it does these stick slip stuff at its base but you're only 800 meters away so you can really you could actually and so we um, former student and I recently um, published a paper where we could really see the preparatory process and that, you know, those are predictable. I don't know whether or not real earthquakes are predictable, but will and ice stream things are predictable. And you can really watch the uh, slow slip foot migrating in. So there's an interesting analog between that and the subjective zone stuff. Did I get everybody? I don't think I got everybody. Well, um, Emily, in, in aggregate, what I'm hearing is that the field is vibrant and multidisciplinary and there's a lot of exciting stuff to do. Yeah, right. I mean, I, have a, I think you wanted to talk about Caltech eventually, so maybe I should stop there. No, no, that's great. That's great. That's It's just wonderful to hear. Emily, a science communication question. Given that you have written for or have been profiled in a lot of national media outlets, what have you learned that's most effective. Obviously, the public wants to hear eventually that earthquakes are predictable. So how do you manage those expectations given that you retain some sense of optimism that that's something at least worth pursuing? Carefully. I think you treat people as intelligent people and you, you tap into what they already know. Um, if it's anything one-on-one -on -one or with anything live where there's any feedback whatsoever, you make you you check in with what they um, what they know and what they think, um, and that's extremely effective. It's effective in teaching. It's effective in any form of communication. Is to make sure you're having a conversation and not monologuing, um, and. Um, And in general, most people are cognizant of the fact that they want earthquakes to be predictable, and most people are cognizant of the fact that they've been told it's impossible. And so you acknowledge that they already know both of those realities. And then once you've kind of got it on the same page, you can carefully say, well, these are the reasons I'm a little optimistic, and they'll hear it. But they, 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 you want to first sort of ground yourself in what they already know. 
Emily, some institutional questions between the AGU and the GSA, SCEC, IRIS. What are the scientific societies or groups that are really important for you in terms of getting the research done? Oh, well, there's a, there's a question I didn't expect. Um, uh, IRIS and its successor is mission critical. Um, having a consortium, community, public access, and instruments and observations, I'm an observational scientist. It, it, it would cease to function without it. Um, and same thing for Iris and its successor, because I'm including UNAFCO in that, which is the geodetic half of it. Um, I mean, I take HU for granted as a meeting. Um, I guess maybe um, we don't take anything for granted after the pandemic, but I would think we would suffer if we didn't have an annual meeting where people actually knew that they could like see, well, we have suffered over the last couple of years. Um, but I also, and I think something I've sort of, you know, as I try to create something new with SC4D, um, NSF. <laughs> NSF is a kind of special agency um, and you know and I go internationally and different people's agencies work really differently and NSF you know it, it's far from perfect but it's it's a lot closer to perfect than a lot what a lot of countries have to work with well let's go back now we'll establish some context before you get to Caltech at Harvard were you interested in geophysics and seismology? Was that already where you were headed? Uh, geophysics, yes. Seismology, no. Um, I sort of discovered geophysics my second year there um, after a cross-country road trip when I was recovering from being a math major. Um, and um, I had some extremely good mentors at Harvard. Um, and I was interested in fluid dynamics. I spent a lot of time in engineering with Howard Stone. Um, and, um, and I was sort of interested in dynamics. Um, and um, I went to Caltech saying I would do anything but seismology. Which, you know, had foreseeable consequences. Um, but uh, no, I, I, I thought wiggly lines were boring and kind of dry. My friend uh, Mie pointed out that uh, Mie Ichihara was a postdoc at Caltech uh, when I was a grad student and um, she's Japanese and she would say, she said, you know, seismograms are a little bit like Asian calligraphy um, that, you know, they're very much at a, you have to get your eye in. <laughs> and once you can see it, they're beautiful things, but it takes a long time to get your eye in. When it was time to apply to graduate school, where were you looking? Um, I was looking at Caltech and MIT, and I guess I looked at Hopkins also, because uh, I thought I wanted to be a volcanologist. I guess that was the other thing that was going on then is, um, Right, and so I was looking specifically at a particular volcanologist at Hopkins. I basically went where Rick and Rick O'Connell was also my undergrad mentor. Rick and Howard told me to apply because that's I think what undergrads do. Um, and um, oh, and I looked at Stanford as well. Why ultimately Caltech? What what was most compelling to you? I decided at some point in the process that I needed to move west, that that's where geology was happening, and I needed to see some rocks, and the East Coast was not where it was happening, and I think there was a search about it. I was, you know, I grew up on the East Coast, and I was ready to move away, 3,000 miles away. Um, yeah, I was looking at the joint pro program. That was sort of the last contender, was the joint program between MIT and Woods Hole. It was sort of an exciting place at the time. 
Um, I then came out and visited. I had a great visit. I had a very unusual class at Caltech, and I'm sure we'll get there. And um, and that was the one and only year, I think, to the best of my knowledge, that they ran a field trip to recruit people. Um, and it was a great field trip. Lee Silver ran it. Um, I, I think they had had a bust the year before on recruitment, and so they decided to get their act together and uh, recruit. Um, and they ran this field trip, and it, um, and some of my, you know, I stayed friends with some of those people from that field trip. I think almost all of us ex who went on the field trip except for one ended up enrolling. Um, and then I went to visit Stanford and I saw a bunch of extremely unhappy grad students. So that wasn't going to happen. Um, and uh, so then that was the decision. What year did you arrive at Caltech? 95. And was it the Seismo Lab specifically that you went to or was it more generally JPS and you wanted to see what was happening across the division? I think I was more generally GPS. I mean, they put me in the Seismo Lab um, and because I think they knew me better than I knew me at that point in time. But I arrived saying I wanted to study volcanology and I was told by various people that they were incredibly confused by my application because they were going to admit me, uh, but they they absolutely couldn't figure out where I fit because uh, they didn't have any volcanologists. Uh, and I wrote this whole application about how I wanted to do volcanology. <laughs> so they um, stuck me in the side of the lab, but I also, but particularly my first year, spent a lot of time going um, and hanging out with the petrology group at Stolper's group and went to their group meetings regularly and then eventually decided I was not in fact a petrologist. I've had the privilege of talking to some of the first women graduate students in the Seismo lab from the 1970s and 1980s. A generational question for you. What was the gender balance like when you arrived? Was, was, were women still in the distinct minority or had, had it gotten better by that point? It was, my class was the year it changed. Okay, so we were totally evenly split in my class. Uh, in fact, possibly we were slightly majority women, I think. So I came in with this very large class. There were 19 of us, oh, GPS wide. And in the size of lab, let me think it was Magalie, Jane, Debbie Smith, me, and Leo Eisner. And, and I guess Mark Benthian for like half a sec before he left. So it was four women and, and a guy. Um, and so um, it was different by the time. And so I think, you know, and it was sort of different at the moment I arrived. And so we had a extremely tight class socially and all, um, and again, GPS wide. And um, although I am told by older alum about all sorts of things, and even some of my contemporaries felt things that I, I never felt a problem. That's me. Well, that's wonderful. A lot of hard work was done to get up to that moment. Yeah, exactly. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. So from that broad tour of GPS initially, what about JPL? Were you interested in what was happening at JPL? Was that relevant at all for you at that time? No, JPL was not really part of my worldview. I mean, I, my friends worked at JPL. I mean, I knew about it because, you know, sort of socially people were involved, but um, now I, JPL was, it's kind of a blind spot for me. So after petrology, how did you focus in on, on, on the Seismo Lab? What was that process like? Oh, that uh, was all about individuals. Um, I was a devotee of Seismo Coffee. Um, I went twice a day when I was up early enough in the morning, definitely once a day when I was in the afternoon. Um, I still do Seismo Coffee with my group here. I think we're the last one standing. I don't think Caltech does it anymore, but that's where I was right before I came here. We At 10 o'clock every day, we have coffee together and talk science. And uh, we've done it. We did it on Zoom all the way through the pandemic. Um, and um, 
and I started through those coffees, a conversation. I when I arrived, Brad Sturdivant, who was in engineering, um, um, and Hero had a project for me on earthquake triggering and the fluid dynamics involved. They kind of wanted to build up my flu. And Brad was as close to a volcanologist as Caltech had, so that was. That was their solution to the Emily wants to be a volcanologist problem. <laughs> um, and, um, and so they got Brad and Hero together. And so I that was my first project. And then actually my first paper was actually weirdly a lab paper with shock tubes with Brad. Um, and, um, and, um, and then that conversation, I started out primarily working with Brad and sort of happily working on volcanoes. I went to volcano meetings and Hero very, with a great deal of patience that I sort of appreciate more in hindsight, just kept talking to me. Um, <laughs> and we just kept talking. And, you know, I would always drop by his office for with some sort of idea or something around five o'clock in the afternoon. And now that I'm a grown up, I realize how absolutely annoying that must have been. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a very, very nice person. He is, because he, he didn't seem to bother him. That five o'clock in the afternoon was the time that Emily would wander in and want to chat for an hour. Um, and, um... And, you know, I would leave stuff in his box at night and he'd come in very early in the morning and I work till one or two in the morning. So I was I'm pretty nocturnal. And so um, I was very nocturnal as a grad student. And, um, and then he'd come in. So we'd sort of have a 24 hour cycle going. And, you know, that was so much fun that, you know, by year three, I finally admitted, you know, I think my advisor might be hero. <laughs> But it took me, and I think I might even be a seismologist. But um, <laughs> but it took me about three years to get there. Emily, another generational question. So I've heard stories, you know, from the Frank Press years, where the Seismo Lab thought of itself and was widely regarded as sort of the center of the universe for seismology. Did that did that feeling, whether deserved or not, did did that stay? with the seismo lab when you were a graduate student oh yeah they were sure they were the center of the universe they still are sure they're the center of the universe and i think that was my learning curve when i left the seismo lab was to understand that they were not in fact the center of the universe there was a very steep learning curve when i figured that out after i left so you know 50 or 60 years ago a lot of that had to do with the proprietary nature of data, that the Seismo Lab simply had stuff that no one else did. By the time you were there, was seismology and geophysics sufficiently connected enough where that was no longer the case? Yes. Then how, you know, how would it have made the case that it was so central, in other words? I think you'll have to ask someone else that question. <laughs> um, they just thought they were smarter than everyone else. Uh -huh. What was Hero working on at the time you connected? Hero always introduced himself in an interesting way that I think I somewhat inherited, which is he introduced himself. He said, oh, I'm working on whatever my students are working on. And so he would never tell me what he was working on. And in a lot of ways, I've pieced together his intellectual trajectory much later, much later than when, when I was a grad student, I was very unaware of his intellectual trajectory. And at first, it's only in the last few years that I understood quite how preoccupied he was with earthquake prediction. I, did, I didn't understand that as a grad student because he had just gotten over it by the time I was there. Um, and so what he was working on when I showed up, I think, was more or less a lot of stuff on scale, earthquake scaling, irradiated energy. That's what he worked on with Anu, um, Venkata Raman. Um, I don't know if you're talking to her, but um, and she, um, yeah, and he was sort of gearing up on the early warning stuff, and he was just 
you know, had built out the Terrascope network and was interested in using that data and how that can be used um, for um, making shape maps and those sorts of things. But, you know, he's so curious and it kind of never bothered him that I wasn't necessarily working on what he was already working. That was sort of a non-issue. It was more an interpersonal connection. You worked well together. Yeah. Yes. What were some of the big debates that were happening in the lab at that point? What were people excited about? Well, there was the constant conversation about earthquake energy budgets. When I went back to visit 10 years later, they were still having the conversation. Um, and um, What was it? What were people talking about? You draw a triangle and you figure out whether or not there's absolute complete stress drop or not and where all the energy goes in the earthquake and how that constrains the physics. Um, and I suppose there's a line to be drawn from that to my work on earthquake friction and taking the temperature on the fault. There's a very direct line. Um, oh, please explain it. What is the line? Well, I mean, it's the same problem. The issue is um, what, you know, do, looking at the energy balance of an earthquake is something that can turn, you know, the forces and processes into something observable. And so um, the problem with the energy balance is on earthquakes specifically has to do with what the absolute stress is on the fault. That the total energy available to elastic energy to be expended depends on the absolute level of stress. If it's high stress, you have a lot more energy uh, available to you than if it's low stress. And the seismological observations can't tell you the absolute level of it. The seismology tells you about stress changes. You know, you bang on a table, it's the stress change that makes the waves, if you press slowly, uh, you know, if you just put a quasi static weight on it you know, that doesn't make any seismic waves. And so, uh, so, you know, the fact that I realized that that was not a seismic, you know, I was here a student who studied earthquakes by not doing seismology. That's, I think, maybe my claim to fame. Um, and, you know, I, I do seismology, but it's not my focus. Um, and, I'm not sure any of his other students ever really went there. Um, and um, and I think I realized from sort of those, you know, what are the word I'm looking for? Um, the infinite loop of the energy balance conversations um, that this was not going to be a problem solved by seismology and that one needed a, a larger set of tools in one's repertoire. And, and maybe was... a little bit of that was my initial reticence to even do seismology in the first place. Um, Did you see that as an opportunity? That's where you could slot in? Yeah, I'm not sure it was a fully conscious decision. It wasn't, a, but I think it came from sort of my, you know, iconoclastic instincts that um, I never really wanted to be a seismologist. And so this was how I could, could yeah, this is something I could do and not be a seismologist. Um, but I, 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 don't, I don't think that was a fully articulated thought at the time, but, the, but there is a lie to be drawn from sort of my emotional reactions to those conversations and what I ended up doing. What field work or observational work was most important for your thesis research? None. Um, I did field work, well, observational work, lots of stuff, but field work I did sort of recreationally as a grad student. I went and volunteered myself to do a field deployment at Long Valley with some USGS people, which was kind of a miserable experience, um, but, you know, got me out and about and learning stuff. And I did something similar going to Kamchatka with a bunch of people I met at a meeting. I, took a perimeter and tagged along and also learned a ton, but none of it made it to my thesis. Um, what was actually in my, so all of that was, you know, intellectually valuable. Um, but, and um, possibly the most formative 
say it was fairly late in my grad, well, two things. Actually, now I start thinking about three things. Um, fairly late in my grad career, um, we were starting to get very interested in dissipation and faults and the width of the dissipative zone. And I guess Hero had just done a paper with Don Anderson about the Bolivia earthquake and dissipation. And so that all of that revolved about how thick the fault zone was. And so Hero was starting to talk to some geologists. And we got Fred Chester out and gave us all a field trip to the Punchbowl Fault, which was um, actually a place I had gone in my, when I, my first or second year of grad school, I decided, it must have been second year, I'm, I decided to take a course, uh, an intro mapping geology course, which was an undergrad course. And none of the sides of a lab advises met my courtesy. <laughs> oh, you know, they all thought it was a crazy thing to do, but I thought I needed to go learn something about rocks. And so I went and did that. Um, and that turned out where Barclay took us on that trip turned out to be the same locality that we went back to for this field trip later for the Punchbowl Fault. And I remember sort of standing there with Hero and with Brad, um, looking at this fault in the field and just sort of starting to understand what it is you can learn from rocks about process. And I think that was actually quite influential. Um, I think having done that field mapping class was quite influential with Barclay, I think who has the honor of being the only person I've ever talked about thermodynamics with before 8 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> That's rare company. <laughs> it is rare company. Berkeley was great. Um, and um, but I think what other observations were influential? An interesting question. The uh, Chi Chi earthquake was very influential, which happened while I right towards the end. Why? What was it about it? Uh, that it had this difference in ground shaking. Um, the high frequency, there was a difference in how the high frequency and low frequency behaved of that earthquake at the north and the southern end of the fault. And it was potentially very instrument, well instrumented with strong ground motion stations. And so that's when I started to understand how to put together. So I had been, so I guess it, the earthquake happened in September of 99. And um, let me just think through the timing. The timing was actually weirder than I realized. Is that really right? That it happened in, yes, it happened in September of 99, right? That's when Chi Chi happened, right? 21st, right? Yeah. yeah um, and so, um, oh, that's interesting. I guess I hadn't quite put together the timing. Um, so, must have been right when I got back from Kamchatka. Uh, so, because I was in Kamchatka in September of 99. Um, and, um, and I guess the Ismid earthquake, 99 was an important year for me, <laughs> <laughs> was, that, was that year as well. And um, so the Ismid earthquake was sort of my first, you know, I'm going to just run after this earthquake and understand it and look at the dynamic triggering in Greece and sort of Luis Rivera introduced me over email to some guy in the, um, who I to this day have never met in the uh, geological um, survey equivalent to Greece, the seismic network, and we sort of did a uh, paper together on how the Turkish earthquake triggered earthquakes in Greece. And that was the first time I sort of ran after an earthquake and sort of found the story in it. And then um, Chi Chi happened. And, um, and I, at that time, I was sort of spinning up on the story about hydrodynamic lubrication of faults with Brad and Hero, which was in some sense a continuity of my undergrad, thinking about um, how viscous flows works in my sort of wanting to be a fluid dynamicist and thinking about the um, lubrication physics of how gouge might behave inside a fault zone. And I had sort of come up with a theoretical framework of how this would work, but I really didn't understand how to hook it into observations. Um, 
I could sort of hook it into maybe some geological observations, but I, I, I was sort of stuck on how to make an observational test of it. And, um, and um, Chi Chi had this difference in how the fault, where it slipped a lot, the ground shaking was actually quite moderate and where it the high the high frequency ground shaking and the opposite and where it slipped less it was much more chattery and so that seemed to work well with this lubrication idea that where it slips a lot then you becomes lubricated the friction goes down and it chatters less and um in working out that story um that story's worked out partially when um, here is former student Kuo Fung Ma, who you should definitely talk to if you haven't already talked to Kuo Fung. If you haven't talked to Kuo Fung, you should talk to Kuo Fung. Okay. Um, and uh, she's in, oh, hey, was it, was, is in Taiwan um, and has done extremely well there. And she came back right after Chi Chi and came to here and said, you know, what should I do about this earthquake? Uh, basically, because she, she is very capable in a number of senses. Among them, she is the best diplomat I know. Um, and she, you know, at this point, runs, I don't know what swath of the scientific enterprise in Taiwan, but it's a big one. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> She's always my go-to one. Um, even though we've never, we never overlapped at Caltech, but we got connected over Chi Chi when she came back. And she said, what do I do about this? And then I was walking down the hallway. And I mean, I think Hero practically literally grabbed me and said, talk to Kuo Fung. Um, and we sort of figured out this story about lubrication, which became a major part of sort of the story of Chi Chi. And, um, and then she started up a drilling project. And she decided that, you know, to answer these questions, we really needed to go look at the fault. And then I got involved in that drilling project and that was my first drilling project. And so that involvement with Quo Fung and Jim Mori got involved um, was extremely instrumental in how I thought about things going further. What were some of the instruments or broadly speaking, the technology that was most important for your thesis research? Uh, technology? Well, just having public data. I mean, you know, the fact that I, you know, it was still a new thing then that I could just sit at my computer and download the waveforms. Right, right. And that that was life changing. Where was the data coming from? Uh, the waveforms came from Iris for the most part. Uh, the catalogs at that point in time were more or less being composited by Berkeley. Um, and, um, I mean, it, the data, the instruments were everywhere, you know, from a whole bunch of regional networks and the global seismic network. So the laboratory experience that you have now, to some degree, that was not really part of your no, research. That came much later, much later. That did. What, what's the origin story of that? Was there a seed planted in you in, in, at Caltech where you realize you wanted to be more involved in a laboratory setting? Maybe. I mean, my first project actually was a lab project. They tried to make a laboratory experimentalist out of me. I went over to Brad's lab and was sort of a, the lab assistant on these shock tube experiments to look at rapid degassing for explosive as um, they were water and CO2 and a shock tube and then you popped it and you degassed it. It took a high speed movie, which in those days was a high speed film camera. And we projected it on the wall, and then uh, my job was to trace around the little blobs of fluid as on 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 the piece of paper as we projected it on the wall, <laughs> and we did it frame by frame and measured the speed. I kid you not. Um, <laughs> and so you know, um, it worked. Um, and I think that did sort of plant a seed of experimental work. But I was not lab comfortable, and I, I sort of learned over time that that's a common issue, is that people who simply are just too uncomfortable with physical, you know, screwing around with stuff in the lab, that that is a barrier. Um, and, um, you know, they really wanted me to do more lab work than I did. 
Um, I when did I start really doing lab stuff? Some two years ago to some extent. Uh, so where did that come from? I think eventually I just wanted to answer questions. Like I stopped. I got annoyed by being dependent on other people's labs. Um, and so I kept wanting to answer these experimental questions and I kept running around to colleagues. I went through a phase where I was going to Penn State a lot uh, to use Christopher Rhodes lab. And What was happening there? What was his lab doing? Oh, he has a big uh, biax that's a rock mechanics lab. And so we did some experiments where I was, we were looking at how seismic waves change the permeability of rocks, uh, which was something that I, we, uh, previous student um, and I had sort of figured out observationally. We had looked at, um, it was a 2006 paper where we looked at uh, the tidal response in wells and showed that regional earthquakes pushed, um, uh, changed the permeability and um, probably by pushing uh, seismic, the seismic waves pushing fluids in and out of wells and um, unclearing fractures and then we wanted to understand the mechanics of that and so we um chris sort of offered his apparatus and we went we did a bunch of experiments there and i did that for a while um and then eventually i got tired of running to penn state to do experiments and then um and sort of we got to the end of that train of thought for a while and the end of the postdocs and the postdocs moved here because he liked it here better than penn state um and um Yeah, but my, um, and then it's the granular flow stuff that I guess really got me into the lab, um, which I guess was an outgrowth of the lubrication stuff. When I was at, it's always about people. Um, in the end, it's always about people. Um, it's you know, I tend to, and I think I share this with Hero that I tend to be very influenced by whoever I'm around at any moment in time, and open to being pushed in directions. Um, and um, I was, when I, at the beginning of my career, I was on the faculty at UCLA. And um, there was somebody over in engineering who had a rheometer and wanted to talk to me and do experiments. And he was, I think he was just sort of casting around for a connection. And I said, well, I did this lubrication stuff but I was never, and I always thought maybe the gouge behaved like a fluid, but I was never really clear on what the right biology of the gouge was. So why don't we do some experiments in your rheometer? I mean, I, I think it was that. It, I think we were having lunch and, you know, we were all junior faculty together and he had worked with Howard before. And so he somehow that endeared him to me. And so, um, so we did that and, um, and then those experiments turned out to be pretty interesting. And so when I got here, um, I got a rheometer and started um, continuing that line of experiments. And I guess Paul Johnson pushed me in that direction. Paul was um, at Los Alamos and he um, had was also interested in the connection between granular flow and fault gouge physics. And he had some resources to buy me a rheometer basically. So he bought me a rheometer. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> Still have it. Um, and we did a bunch of experiments together on that. And then that sort of started me off actually having a lab. And it was a fairly small sort of hobby for a, really, I would say until two years ago. And now it's a hobby that's got it a little out of control. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's sort of how I've started having a lab. I just moved to a bigger room a couple of years ago and now it's, you know, expanded to fill the space. Emily, having the internet, really one of, if not the first academic generation in graduate school to have the internet, did that make your graduate research more sedentary than it otherwise would have been? Would you have done more field work if not for the ability to download data from wherever you wanted? Yes, I think, I yeah, I think, that was 
it's interesting that you say that. I think that was the watershed of why we were doing things the way we were doing things, is we were suddenly, I mean, when I was a grad student, they were still trying to get us to work in the computer lab because your desk didn't have a computer on it when I first got there. And um, the computers were in the computer lab. And I threw a temper tantrum at one point and said, actually, I'd like to work at my desk. Can I have a computer on my desk, please? And that was that was a novel concept that I think I was probably one of the first students in the lab to have a computer on my desk. Um, and then, of course, everybody did. Um, uh, and, um, and then what happened immediately after that was that my hands went out. Uh, because we were not up, we didn't really, the desks weren't built for computers, they weren't built, nobody knew what we were doing to our bodies at that time. <laughs> so, um, and so, um, and so, and, and I went out, and then Sarah, and then, and Ben Weiss, I mean, we all went out one after another, all of our hands went. Um, so I, I road tested the occupational therapist, and then we all ended up going to the same PT. Um, and, um, and, um, you know, in, in retrospect, they, they, they totally didn't know how to treat it either. They tra treated it like, you know, you had a hand injury and put me in splints and I was trying to type in splints for a while, which was, you know, it made everything worse. Um, and so, yeah, no, there was a real change and we didn't yet know even how to do it that way. And it changed the kind of science we did. The fact that to me, the resource was Iris, not the Caltech network. Um, and, um, and it, you know, and it physically changed how we had to like actually do stuff. What are the benefits and pitfalls looking back? What did you gain from having all this ability to have data come to you? And what did you lose from not going out and doing more of the research yourself? Well, I consider analyzing the data, the research, I would push back on that a little bit. Um, that is the research. Uh, no, I mean, just I, in terms of leaving Caltech, going out into the field. Uh, right. I. Well, I always kept going. I mean, you know, as I said, I would volunteer myself for these things. And so even though that wasn't the data I ended up using, I got a fair amount of experience of, you know, I knew what a seismometer looked like. I knew what an installation looked like and all of that. I don't think everybody did that. Um, I do think... Yeah. I think, I mean, in terms of science, this ability to just reach out and grab data from anywhere in the world, I mean, was transformative, you know, that's part of why at least I could take the approach I always have, which is I'm just going to go follow the problems and I don't need to have this sort of regional investment in a particular place or particular instrument. Um, it gave me a ton of freedom. The internet's a good thing. Um, what was lost? I don't know what was lost. I wasn't there beforehand to know. I'm sure something was lost, but I, I, it's hard for me to put a, my finger on it. Emily, what was Hero's style like as a mentor? In other words, obviously you, you, you meshed wonderfully on, a, on an interpersonal level, but how hands-on was he in what you were doing? Oh, very skilled. Um, and, I, you know, I had two mentors. I had Brad and Hero. Um, and it worked extremely well as a team because, you know, as far as Brad was concerned, everything I did was terrible. And as far as Hero was concerned, everything <laughs> I did was perfect. And so I knew reality had to be somewhere in the middle. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, no, he was definitely a good cop. Um, and uh yeah and he 
you know, was extremely enthusiastic and engaged in the science and sort of willing to talk about it forever. And, um, you know, as much time, you know, the hours and hours and hours I have spent talking to Hiro Katamori, the amount of time we talk about anything other than science, it's got to be like this much. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so, um, so the interpersonal was scientific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, and I think he was very skillful. Now that I have advised for a lot of years, I could see what he was doing, but I didn't see it at the time, which is that he, well, what he told me when I first started advising is always encourage, never push. He actually said that to me, because um, I think he saw that I was pushing too much. Um, and he, uh, oh, um, and so that was very much as what the way he did it is, you know, he would find something to encourage um, and um, very gentle guiding. When did you know you had enough to defend? <laughs> right? It's got to end sometime. No, oh, no, this is a very funny story, actually. That's why I'm laughing because there, there was a moment I was ready to go. Um, I just, I was ready. He wanted me to do one more project. He wanted me to work on this um, uh, Miyakajima sequence. Um, and we were kind of, it's kind of the only fight we ever had. Um, we were kind of having a fight about it in August of 2000. And um, he went to visit the Pope. He, some, I don't know why he went to visit the Pope. He, somebody... I think it must have been Enzo. Somebody invited him to go visit the Pope. And so he was, he went to visit the Pope. You ask him why he was visiting the Pope. I don't know why he was visiting the Pope, but he was away for a week. Um, and so I took all my papers and I reformatted them. I saved them again and came back from the Pope. And I'm like, here's the thesis. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm leaving. Wow. <laughs> um, and he really wanted that Miyakajima stuff in there. And I, I, I was done. You put your foot down. Yep. Obviously, it worked out. It worked out okay. Who else was on your committee? That's complicated. Um, so my committee was Hero and Brad and I guess originally Ed Stolper would have been the third. Uh, but Brad passed away uh, a week before my defense. Yeah. Uh, right. He got you. Do you know about Brad? Yeah. I know. But, You're but, the Caltech historian. Yeah. But please tell me, tell me how you heard of the news. Well, um, Brad had cancer. He told me at the end of August, beginning of September, somewhere around there, he was diagnosed. Uh, he had pancreatic cancer. And so he told me, I heard the news because he told me, he told me himself um, in his office. Um, and told you in the sense time. that he might not survive to the defense like that? Well, he told me, well, I, can I remember his words? I mean, he told me I had pancreatic cancer. And he t oh, what, I do remember what he said. He said, well, I said, what am I going to do? He goes, well, you're lucky you have two. Yeah. It won't be a problem. Yeah. Um, and, and that was the last time I saw him. Because uh, he declined very, very rapidly after that. I remember I was trying to see him a visit, and you know, Carol just wasn't having any of it and wasn't interested. Um, and after that, and and I mean, it was well. I guess I must have seen him one more time after he told me, because I remember him sort of looking aged, but um, over a course of a couple weeks, like he had aged ten years over several, a couple weeks. And then, because I, I do remember that, and then he had passed away by early October, the week, as I said, he, he passed away a week before my defense. And then, uh, and so then Don Anderson substituted it at the last moment. What, what influence did Brad have on you? What, what lasted from your interactions with him? Oh, quite a bit. Um... 
I didn't put this there. Maybe that's where the experimental bug came from. Who knows? Could that, be. That's kind of what I was thinking. That's, that <laughs> could seems be. like that's that the could connection. be. That could be. Um, that's fair. Brad worked on my writing. Oh my God! Did Brad had had it with my writing? That was some <laughs> of the biggest fights we had with, was over my writing. Um, we would yell at each other. We would really scream at each other. And um, I, he had a secretary sitting in his outer office, and she would just like cower. <laughs> He's like, what's going on in there? And the biggest fight we had, I think, was over M dashes. You know, the ones that have three. Absolutely. It was it it was an issue. Um, but I think I had sort of scooted through with being a pretty good writer up to that point, so nobody ever really took me to task because I was good enough, and so they were working on the people who were not that good. And so he he fixed my writing. Maybe a careful proofreader, you know. I he told me I was lazy, and I said I wasn't lazy. Anyhow, um, he made me into a careful proofreader and 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 a much better writer. Writing matters, even for scientists. Especially for scientists. <laughs> and I, my mother always thought I was going to be a writer. And I tell her I am a writer. That is what I do for a living. I write. Um, and at this point, I think I'm a pretty good writer. Um, but um, yeah, no, Brad definitely was influential in my writing. Um, and um, he, he also, um, he said, if you're going to go into a new field, you should have an unfair advantage. That was one of his statement. What do you think he meant by that? Just being oh, ahead, I, I ahead know of the curve? I know exactly what he meant by it, uh, which is, you know, he was this fluid dynamicist, you know, shockwave guy who went into volcanology. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. And so... He could do things going... that no one else could. Exactly. And that, that's a good way to enter into a new field. Right. And I have pulled that trick repeatedly in my career <laughs> following his advice. Um... <laughs> And um, yeah, so I think that 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 I will say is both right. By the time you defended, what opportunities were available to you? What were you looking at? Job wise? Yeah, I mean, in terms of postdocs, faculty appointments. Um, I had my NSF postdoc lined up with Michael Manga and uh, to go to Oregon. And so that's what I did right after. I defended in October, I hung out for a few months and then I moved January 1 up to Oregon. And what was compelling about Michael's group? What was happening there? Uh, Michael had been after me for a few years. Um, um, and I had known him from when he was a grad student at Harvard when I was an undergrad. So we knew each other quite, um, and he just kept talking to me at various meetings and sort of had been very interested in this uh, fluids and faulting thing and uh, the well, the um, what you could tell from hydrological systems about observe, um, earthquakes. And so, and I had started getting into that problem as a grad student. That's right. Um, people must have given me this can't believe I could just put my hand on it quite that quickly still. Notes are carricated out. This is my grad student handwriting. Um, there was this sort of funny little thing from RPI uh, that I Kira must have given this to me of a technical report from 1964 about water wells as used as seismometers for earthquakes and explosion detection. So that's right. This was Hero's fault. Um, he had gotten me interested in the water well and earthquake problem. And he, that was also my first trip to Japan, which was, uh, so I'm going backwards in time, sorry. Um, he had gone to some review panel or another and but was talking to his friend Rakita, who was about to retire because it was um, the mandatory retirement in 
still do, but it was younger than in Japan, um, and was an expert on looking at water wells and earthquakes. And um, Hiro was very interested in this as a sort of underutilized observation. And I got very interested in it in grad school, although I didn't really do anything about it until later. But Hiro certainly pushed me down that road. Uh, no, he didn't push, he encouraged. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and and Rakita said, well, I think basically Kira was telling him he, he had this uh, great grad student who was interested in these problems. And uh, Rakita's like, well, let me invite her over. And so it was this bizarre trip where I was invited right before his retirement. I suspect he was just burning his money at the end of you know his projects and was invited to go absorb his knowledge. Um, like literally a couple of weeks before his retirement. And um, so I went and visited the lab. I got this big tour of uh, what they were doing in the lab. And then um, we went and did some field work. And I tugged, tagged along in some field work on the Izu Peninsula and got showed all these water wells. And I had never been in Japan before. And um, it, that was an extremely influential trip. And, um, and, um, I got interested in what you could do on water chemistry and water wells um, and studying earthquakes. That led to the whole the permeability enhancement stuff. And then, um, and then I was telling Michael about this over a succession of AGUs, and he was. Although I guess my NSF proposal was actually to do volcanology with him. That's what it was. All right, sorry. I think I figured out what happened is that I still wanted to be a volcanologist. And Michael was willing to tell me I was still going to be a volcanologist. Nobody, nobody else would lie to me. <laughs> Michael said I was still going to be a volcanologist. And we were going to get together. And I was going to work with him and Kathy, Kathy Cashman. And we were going to do volcanology at Oregon. I said, great, I'll come do a postdoc with you. And then, but he kept talking to me about the water well problem. And you know, of course, when I got there, I never did volcanology, I did water wells. Um, and that sort of started this whole hydrological earthquake thing that I think was a huge, has been a huge part of what he's done since then. Including, um, including the fracking stuff? Well, I mean, fracking is sort of a related phenomenon, but yeah, they including the permeability enhancement stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we wrote together when I was a postdoc, a paper about a particular well at Oregon that sort of spun up that field. Um, where you can look at the analyze the reaction of the water well to the seismogram because they're both at very high resolution this high frequency water well data and you can see the response to the seismic wave change in the middle of the waveform um and so that's what started this whole permeability enhancement thing um and so um but yeah he told me I was going to become a volcanologist and we were going to work on volcanology together. And so I went to Oregon to work on volcanology. And then as soon as I got there, he took the job at Berkeley. So then I got applied to where I got the Miller Fellowship. And then we all moved to Berkeley six months later. Um, so that's kind of how that worked. Um, uh, so I was only in Oregon for six months, uh, but it was a good six months. Um, and then I was at Berkeley for another seven months. I was planning to be there for three years, but then 9-11 happened. Yeah. Um, and my well, now husband, uh, then fiance, um, was working at um, Ames, um, on, uh, but he had an external fellowship and he's British and the way that all shook down was he lost access to the facility after 9-11. Uh, we all tried to explain that we were all bombing the same people together, but that, that explanation didn't fly. And British citizens were not in fact, or any other non-US were not allowed in the facility. So he effectively lost his job. Um, and so uh, we, and I, I already had the offer from UCLA at that point, and I would, I had been planning on not taking the offer because uh, they had not come through with anything for him. And um, I was perfectly happy with the Miller Fellowship, um, but we just did sort of 
very quickly um, after, like in December, like over the course of a couple weeks, decided to move to UCLA. And so we did that. Emily, what's the takeaway, even the, the poetic takeaway of starting at Caltech and thinking you were pursuing volcanology and then really jumping right back into it for your postdoc? I wanted to be a volcanologist. <laughs> <laughs> and Caltech was just holding you back the whole time. Well, you know, I can't blame them because I'm still studying earthquakes now. So I don't think that was a, it was necessarily a problem. But, um, you know, I, you know, there's only so much they can take the blame for. But um, So to go back to that formative advice from Brad about, you know, being ahead of the curve. Did you see that to be the case based on your education at Caltech and what you pursued afterwards? Um, yes. Um, I have a good fundamentals and I am very comfortable with observations and uncertainty. and. Those have served me well. When you got to Oregon and then all the institutions afterward, to go back to that very interesting thing you said about Caltech Seismolab, thinking it's the center of the universe, did you think that in real time or that's more of a retrospective comment that you could only make based on being elsewhere and looking back? That is retrospective. I don't think I, I, I certainly didn't understand that at the time. Mm -hmm. And when I graduate, okay, I'm, I'm going to have to go in a minute. Weon, is that you? Sabrina, would you do me a huge favor? I'm just finishing something up, and I'm supposed to be at Weon's progress report. Could you, like, stick your head in the IGPP room and tell him I'll be there in five minutes? Thanks. Emily, that's perfect timing, because I'm about... What? Oh, do I have an extra mask? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, not cruddy mask. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem at all. So, um... I'm making you late now. That's perfect timing because it keys up my last question, which is, it goes back to the, the previous one, which is, what did you learn at Caltech? The style of doing the science, the way of interacting your, with your colleagues that stayed with you ever since and has made possible so many of the things that you've gone on to accomplish? Um, like so many things. Um, I learned to be careful. I don't think we talked about it much, but I think that is what I learned. I'll lay that at Brad's door and Hero's door, both of them. Um, Careful in I, analyzing the data? Yes. And thinking carefully to be careful. Um, I think I went in there with a lot of enthusiasm and some reasonable education before then, but I, I had not yet learned to be careful. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a personality thing. I think by nature, I needed to be taught to be careful. Um, and to, to connect all my dots. And um, and I don't, I don't think I needed to be taught the value of sort of going out and talking to people, but I mean, content wise, I knew nothing. I had sort of a lot of raw energy, but I, I was sort of mushy when I got there. I wanted to be a volcanologist. And I even really know what a volcanologist was. I mean, and so it, it's the rigor, it's being careful, and it's, you know, you know, I remember here saying the thing you knew least about when you got here was earthquakes. I didn't actually know anything about earthquakes. So, um, I mean, there is a style thing, obviously, that came out of it. 
you know, the seismo coffee style and this highly interactive style of doing science. I may have got it there on my own. I might have got it there kind of just wherever I went. Um, but I think it certainly fostered it and helped it and encouraged that. Um, and I don't want to undersell the actual content of what I learned there either. Emily, this has been a very fun and insightful conversation. Thank you so much. I'm very appreciative of this. Well, thank you.